The corporate sector, of course, is the largest of our three great societal sectors. We have the corporate sector, the business sector, if you like, government and the non-for-profit sector. They're each large. They each employ, at least in this country, um, millions and in the case of the uh, non-for-profit sector, hundreds of thousands of people. But the business sector is the biggest. And um, I know that some people involved in the non-for-profit sector genuinely struggle trying to connect with the business sector. They may well be prejudiced by a view, look, I see that enormous sector full of riches, extraordinary infrastructure in it, profits, etc., etc. Why isn't it more generous? Those same people are sometimes extraordinarily important to get things done in the non-for-profit sector. But sometimes those people with their prejudice are not the right people in the front line to connect philanthropy or connect the non-for-profit sector with business because of who they are. I don't have a problem with that. But the important thing is that the non-for-profit sector does need to identify the right people to throw out those lifelines to connect with business. The reality is that the corporate sector is required by law to maximise return on investment. No use debating that, it's actually part of the law of the land. That's not to say though that there's an enormous amount of good that comes out of the corporate sector. Our goods and services that we take for granted ought to be provided at uh, an ever increasing quality, at an ever decreasing real price. It provides obviously huge employment, it pays a lot of tax, they're the things that we expect. And in recent years, up and down, say, Collins Street, which is the main business street in, uh, in Melbourne, or in Pitt Street in Sydney, the boards have increasingly, certainly amongst our top 100, say, listed com companies, as a matter of fact, been adopting what I call the 1% rule. That's simply a rule that says that um, organisations will contribute 1% of their profits. Um, it's typically profit after tax, although some companies such as BHP go one step better and make it 1% of pre-tax profits, which is typically a larger number. And um, that's something that has occurred, I've observed over around about 20 years. It's been a board discussion, and I really know very few companies that don't subscribe to that view now. It's a good thing. But again, going back to that group that, if you like, aren't wired to understand how the, the corporate uh, sector works, they say, only 1%. Yes, it is only 1%, because uh, Rick Allett was chairman of AMP and I followed him, and I'm sure, uh, sorry, of uh, AXA, rather. But um, chairmen, like Rick and myself, have to spend time with shareholders explaining why the profits are at a certain level, why the dividends are at a certain level. And our largest institutions don't necessarily embrace the idea of corporations giving certainly anything away, let alone 1%. And so that's the reality, and I'm actually not expecting that 1% rule to change uh, any time soon, if at all. But I guess this is really where my story starts, in that there is so much potential for corporations to seriously engage with the philanthropic sector, with just where need is, without in any way compromising profit. In fact, I would argue strongly that when they get it right, they actually make themselves stronger, more resilient companies. And that's what I guess I spend a good part of every week just naturally thinking about. I don't find it hard to think about it. I'm intrigued by it and, uh, and I'm excited when I see a company actually do something clever. And so I just want to give three little stories today which um, are my hopeless attempt perhaps at trying to explain in a, in a real way how, uh, how companies really can end up being better by taking this space seriously. The first actually starts with the place that I have worked with for longest. I've been part-time at Macquarie now for, um, for many, many years, but um, uh, there have been times when I headed up its operation in, in Melbourne, and uh, obviously part of me was always thinking, how can I get Macquarie more involved in the community sector? pretty natural thing to think about. I had a challenge because many of my colleagues were busy. They couldn't plan their weeks, let alone their months or their years. At short notice, they'd often be required to hop on a plane and go to London to be involved in a deal. We are inherently unreliable. Every business is different. Some businesses have 
thousands of employees that you know all the time where they will be and, if you like, are reliable. But an investment banker is typically unreliable in being able to plan where he or she is going to be. And um, about 10 years ago, I was approached by a little organisation called um, First Step. First Step operates in one of our little drug capitals in, in Melbourne, St Kilda. Um, and it's been doing terrific work for, for many years. It had a program of basically taking our heroin addicts and weaning them off. It's a complicated program, but the, one I want, the bit I want to focus on is what they call the secondary carer program. These were where, were where regular people from outside would actually just strike up a relationship with an addict who was being uh, weaned off. And um, the idea was that we would actually have no physical contact with them. It was all done by way of phone. There was plenty of other support that this person had, but this particular program was around the phone. And when I heard about this, I said, this could be the solution, this could be a possibility for anyone working uh, in Macquarie. Because it doesn't matter if all of a sudden we're called off to be in another place. It doesn't stop us connecting by phone to someone in St Kilda or wherever in Melbourne undergoing this uh, program of being weaned off heroin. What they said to me, and, and I actually said, well, look, I'm happy to sign up to this program, and I'll use myself as a bit of a, a guinea pig to, to, to see if it'll work for others. And actually, they required me then to go to, um, I think it was six or eight evenings, two hours each, to be trained as a counsellor. It was a bit of a burden having to do that, but I made the time available. I started off being really grumpy, so you know, I think I can speak to someone on a phone, it's not that big a deal, I do some listening and try and understand where they're at. Well, all I can say is, well and truly before I was allowed to speak to the first addict, and I had my, my several sessions, my eyes were opened. I didn't realise that you know, I'd had this narrow existence, you know, law and commerce and business and what have you, and all of a sudden I was spending some serious time with, frankly, some of the most talented people I'd ever met telling me about counselling, telling me how to really relate to someone who was a million miles away from me in terms of my demography and my background and all that sort of stuff. And as I said, before I even made the first phone call to someone who was in a, a tough place, this non-for-profit had absolutely enriched my life. I hadn't even done anything for it yet. I'd probably consumed its resources. They paid for the program, not me. And I just came out of that two-month period feeling actually a wiser person. And I guess my first point is to think carefully that there are so many ways in which a non-for-profit organisation, just by virtue of what it is, what it's experiencing, can actually enrich the lives of all sorts of other people outside of that uh, sector. Of course, I won't go into detail now, but the program that then unfolded, and I had uh, many years of of regular contact with people that had obviously walked a very different journey to, to, to me was one of the most eye-opening and profound experiences of, um, of my life. And it all started because I just tried to think, what will work for a busy, time-poor, hopelessly organised investment banker? The next example, uh, Nikki, comes from Red Dust... I love it, is it? Mole... Red, Red Dust Moles. Yeah, that's, that's great. Um, <laughs> Red Dust is a little organisation, very, very narrowly focused. It uh, is very aware of, of, of the Indigenous plight. And as I said, with its narrow focus, all it tries to do is to develop relationships with um, communities, typically way out the back of nowhere. And for a few weeks every year, bring into those communities role models. They're typically sporting stars. Um, there'll be a whole bunch of AFL people up there now because their season is finished. They've got a couple of months off before they train again. We've got um, probably uh, a couple of dozen AFL guys up in uh, uh, the Northern Territory in the north of, of Western Australia. But there'll be basketballs, there'll be swimmers, there'll be tennis players. And, and Red Dust just works with these sporting stars, mainly sporting stars, uh, so that in there off periods, they can go and spend some time. Now, you might ask, well, is that actually a sensible idea? Are these people any good? Well, they're just actually ordinary people at the end of the day, but they have this knack. 
If I go into an Aboriginal community, uh, you know, the little kids run around and, and they ignore me, as they should. But, um, you know, send uh, an Adam Goods. Actually, that's not the best example. Send a white guy who is still their sporting hero and they will stop everything and just surround him. And, um, and he has this rare opportunity, or she has this rare opportunity, to talk about the very basic things that so often those communities find hard to talk about, just the basics of getting a good night's sleep, eating good food, being respectful to the parents, not sniffing the, the petrol. You know, the list goes on and on and on. And um, these role models have this extraordinary opportunity to just to impart this knowledge. They have to, just as I was with First Step, be trained, but, um, you know, it's all possible. The little story that I want to tell about First Step happened three years ago. I was very nervous. I was on the board of World Vision, uh, sorry, board of um, Red Dust, and we'd arranged a pretty big visit to a smallish community, 250 people, northwest of Alice Springs, a little place called Arayonga. I was a bit nervous because normally there might be a group of seven or eight of us go, with you know four being these stars and the other four just being you know, ordinary people to make it work. We had a big group. We had 40 people going all up. Um, it actually had another purpose. It was an opportunity to spread the message, raise awareness. We actually had a number of um, sports stars. Well, I'm an Essendon supporter. One of them was James Hurd. I'm not sure where he's at at the moment in terms of being regarded as a role model, but um, Dyson Heppel, uh, unashamedly, he's a fantastic young star. We had Tom Lonergan, um, Jimmy Bartels from Geelong. We had uh, Eddie Maguire, loud as everything, and uh, Mick Malloy, the comedian. And um, anyway, we all flooded into this place. The good news was that the Red Dust team had been thinking about this actual connection for two or three years. And they'd sorted out all the sensitivities. We're actually camped uh, about two kilometres away, um, away from the community in a place that was appropriate, etc., etc. A lot of work had gone into it. And, um, and there were some wonderful light-hearted moments. I remember when uh, Mick Malloy had... Um, uh, he had a plate of um, witchetty grubs to, to eat. And I wasn't really sure whether he wanted to eat them, but he'd been told that the women had spent hours collecting and then preparing these witchetty grubs. And um, typical comedian, he looked at this um, elderly Aboriginal woman, very wide, weathered, wrinkled face. And uh, he, he said to her as he was having his first grub, mmm. I hear you spent a bit of time getting this ready. And she just looked at him, I, this was totally unprepared, and she said, yeah, we've been spending 40,000 years getting these ready. <laughs> it was, you know, you don't often make a guy like Mick Malloy shut up quickly, but um, she, she did it beautifully. Anyway, the issue was that one night we were going to put on a barbecue for the community. We didn't know how many of the 250 people were going to come along. Night fell and then they just appeared out of the shadows. It was really quite mystical. And the idea was that that night there'd be some entertainment. It'd start with the really young kids, just six and seven year olds doing whatever they do, and then teenagers would follow the young men. That was really very physical and you know, pretty amazing. And, and that was really supposed to be the end of the night. I noticed quite early on that I mean, it was really dark, there was no moon, that a, about 100 metres away, 150 metres away, there was another little fire with a group of elderly women around it early on. And they started painting up, you know, they, and, and they were, it was definitely not on the running sheet, I knew that. And at one point I asked one of the, the organisers, what is going on over there? And he said, yeah, we've just heard that the local community are feeling pretty good about this. And, and I didn't understand that because we'd been worried that this thing was going to go pear-shaped because of just the number of white people we had there. But to cut a very long story short, what happened at the end, we had to wait about 45 minutes and it was pretty cold too. Um, but, and, and Eddie Maguire did a lot of grumbling, but, but <laughs> at the, all of a sudden these six or seven older women came in. They had dressed up, some of them had removed the top part of their clothing and proceeded to um, 
dance something very, uh, very significant to them um, called the, uh, the Seven Sisters Dance. And it was inappropriate. You could tell it was not right to talk because the, the entire community was fixated. Uh, I'm talking about the Aboriginal community that sort of sat down in front of us, particularly the young kids they were just watching. And even a couple of the old blokes joined in and they really weren't very good at it. But again, the community was, you could have heard the pin drop. And we didn't find out until the next morning really what had happened. Because as it turns out, the night got going and the young people danced and I don't know whether they were inspired by the fact that there are a whole bunch of sporting heroes there, but they really gave it their best shot. And in a remote community, even though it doesn't have alcohol there, it sort of looks very good compared to so many other communities. But at the end of the day, they have TVs and all sorts of other reasons which, enable, which make it difficult for the older people to pass down the stories, the history, the legacy, and all that sort of stuff. And for whatever reason, the old people that night said, this is the night we're going to do it. The reason I tell the story is it was not on the running sheet. And 40 white people went away from Arayonga fundamentally unchanged, including loudmouths like Mick Malloy and, and um, Eddie McGuire. If any of you ever see them, you ask, what was that experience? like for you in Arayonga in 2011. The final story, and I mentioned this to uh, the former chairman of Coles just a few minutes ago, Rick Allen. It's a great story, I love this story. Rick, I'm gonna say this, Coles doesn't need any friends. It's a big gorilla. It's one of our two largest supermarkets. Um, it's often criticized. And I'm not here actually to represent it at all. It's a story that I became aware of some time ago, but it's actually a wonderful story. The HR department in Coles, and I was corrected by Rick a minute ago, and correct, if I get into the details wrong, Rick, it, they're not important, okay? <laughs> um, Rick told me actually that I think you've got about 180,000 employees anyway. They sent out a, a survey to all of the employees including the kids that work for three hours a week on the checkouts. And long list of questions. The last question was the best. What irks you most about working at Coles? What great courage to ask a question like that. And um, the answer that came back was very interesting. They had a few, obviously, different answers from so many people. But there might have been some sort of campaign behind the scenes. I don't know what it was. But overwhelmingly, the answer that affected the Coles management who perused it was this. We're sick and tired at the end of the day of seeing so much pretty good food. It's not saleable anymore to the high consumer standards. It might be an apple with a dimple in it or some bit of bruised fruit. But seeing it just carted out into these big, big containers, these big uh, boxes, and then sent off to the local municipal tip. Senior Coles management were really concerned about that. Why? Because they had spent years, they had spent decades negotiating the lowest per unit cost of dumping food anywhere in the country. They were proud of the fact that they had everywhere where they were dumping food the very lowest cost of doing it. And all of a sudden 100,000 odd employees were saying, well that's all very good but we don't like it. It doesn't feel right. It's a waste. And then a wonderful thing happened because uh, some younger management in Coles said, this sounds a good challenge for us. And what they did was they rolled up their sleeves, they did some back of the envelope HR work and kind of worked out if they in fact changed their practices, what the, would the impact be on Coles employees? And then they set to work aligning themselves with a non-for-profit organisation called Second Bite. They did a few pilots here and there and what have you and then ramped it up, one state, two states. I'm honestly not sure whether it's happening in South Australia yet, but all I know is there came a point a little while ago where um, Coles is providing through Second Bite five million meals to homeless refuges and all sorts of other organisations that can desperately use that food. It took a bit of work, it took a bit of work to get that whole program up because today Coles is actually spending much more money processing that food. Typically in a supermarket it has to pay a couple of blokes for two or three hours work at the end of the day, sorting out the food that is going to be recycled as opposed to the stuff that really can't 
be, uh, be further consumed, etc., etc. It's costing them more money. But my understanding is the Coles senior management are delighted that it's spending that money with Second Bite and providing millions of meals every year. So Raymond, I haven't given an exposition as you did recently, facts and figures, precisely enunciating how the world of philanthropy should work. Because today I was just really provoked to tell you two or three stories about really what the corporate sector is motivated by. The corporate sector has all sorts of rules. Some of our organisations, such as Coles, are enormous. But at the end of the day, a corporate is really just a group of people is really, in some cases, obviously, a large group of people. But in many respects, the people that I mix with in large corporations are people that they might be time poor, they might be distracted by what they have to do in business, but they're people that just want to see a better world as well. And I guess the challenge, I think, for this nation and other nations is to have a non-for-profit sector replete with people who understand the mind of the corporation. And to see the goodness that's in it, to see the challenges that it has in a competitive marketplace, but nevertheless in creative ways, and hopefully I've given you two or three, where they can actually reach out and engender a relationship that not only works for the individuals in the organisation, but actually makes the corporate itself stronger, which is not a bad thing. You know, there are plenty of ways in which money itself, which obviously is the most important thing that the... Uh, community sector needs can flow from the corporate sector. Just the extraordinary increase in um, corporate giving through employees, it's remarkable, it's fantastic. We have three very good organisations in this country who are facilitating the corporate market to do that better. But I've got to say, I think the best way forward is to ensure that we just don't ask corporations and the highly paid employees and the lesser paid employees for the money out of their wallets, but that as a, a non-for-profit sector, we accompany it with a two-way relationship that we think creatively. What can we actually give that corporation? What can we give to the people that are employed in it? So that indeed, it and they will open their wallets willingly and even more. Thanks very much. Thank